Good morning, everyone. This hearing is called to order. This is a public hearing of the City Council Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities and the Committee on the Environment. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on Resolution 181-113. My name is Councilman Kiana Johnson. I'm the Chairman of the Transportation and Public Utilities Committee. Before we get started, I want to ask for the clerk to please read the title of the resolution. <clears throat> resolution 181113, resolution authorizing the Council on or the, the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities and the Committee on the Environment to conduct hearings regarding how dockless electric scooters could provide an affordable and environmentally friendly transportation option for all Philadelphians. Thank you. Before we get started, I'm going to ask if my colleague, Councilman Al Toppenberger, do you have any remarks on this particular resolution? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, before the clerk call up the witness list, uh, for me, um, this is a very interesting um, hearing, um, simply for the fact that um, I'm an outdoor type of elected official. Um, um, I try to spend as much time as I can um, enjoying myself in, along the Schuylkill River Park Trail, um, enjoying myself um, in the diversity of my neighborhood throughout the areas of Point Breeze, Grays Ferry, um, Center City, as well as Southwest Philadelphia. And I had an opportunity through one of my good friends by the name of John Hawkins to experience uh, riding one of these um, dockless mobile scooters. And I had a good time, but for the most part, when you think about the environment, when you, talk, when you think about the congestion that we're um, facing here in the city of Philadelphia, um, I think that this can also be an alternative to us driving our cars downtown. Listen, I live in Point Breeze, which normally should be about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, from Center City. And on any given day, if I am driving into Center City, it may take me a half an hour Sometimes, Councilman Tottenberger, maybe 45 minutes, depending on the congestion of traffic. So I'm pretty interested in the hearing the testimony um, on this resolution. And at this particular point in time, I want to ask for Councilman, Councilman Al Tottenberger to say a few words. Yeah, I'm City Councilman Al Tottenberger, and Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for conducting this hearing. I think the information we'll gain today will enlighten us all, and particularly to something that is so important to uh, mobility and human people need mobility and this looks like a fun and very interesting way to keep people mobile and enjoying the outdoors thank you mr chairman thank you councilman would a clerk please call the first panel christopher paholsky cheryl betagole nagani nadimbi sorry hey jim Kenyatta. I'm sorry, I'm also joined by Councilman um, Derek Green, who I would like to acknowledge to say a few remarks as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning for this uh, Transportation Public Utilities Committee hearing as well as Committee on Environment. Um, one of the main reasons I introduced uh, this resolution to have conversation regarding uh, e-scooters here in the city of Philadelphia is that through my work in the National League of Cities, I've had the opportunity to visit other cities and see what some of my colleagues have done in LA and uh, Charlotte and some other cities bringing this type of transportation to their cities. Um, transportation is a very important aspect of what we do every day from a mobility perspective as um, the chair stated, but also um, it adds to the fabric and it also can uh, address some of our environmental issues. Um, the fact that it will provide opportunity for people to get, especially that last mile of transportation, um, to their points of destination. And this adds to the transportation network we have in the city of Philadelphia and will hopefully allow people to be less um, tied to using uh, motor vehicles and using other types of transportation. And so as we continually evolve with the various forms of transportation we have in our nation, I thought this was one concept that adds to that. Uh, it's still new to um, this nation, but I wanted to have this conversation. Just yesterday, legislation was introduced in Harrisburg um, to allow 
e-scooters in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, I believe that was a bipartisan piece of legislation. So I think having this conversation today is very timely and gives us an opportunity to have some input in the legislation in Harrisburg as we move forward and investigate this concept and this type of transportation in the city of Philadelphia. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity and thank you for the committee for having this hearing on this resolution. Thank you very much, Councilman Green. Will the first um, panelists um, begin? Yeah. Um, State your name for the record, yeah. please, and, and what other agency or organization or um, whoever you're representing, please. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you, Councilman Johnson and the other members of the committee and Councilman uh, Green uh, for inviting me to testify today on resolution number 181113 sponsored by Councilman Green. My name is Christopher Pahalski. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for the Managing Director's Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability, known as OTIS. And before I go any further, would you mind if we could move these devices? I'm, I'm afraid they're gonna get a little bit in the way, and there's a blinking light here that's a little bit distracting. So if, if we could move them, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Otis leads a portfolio of departments, including the Streets Department, the Sustainability Office, and the Philadelphia Water Department to provide cost-effective solutions and quality services with a focus on the resident. Our strategies and policies support inclusion and equity across Philadelphia's diverse and vibrant communities. In my position at Otis, I'm the Director of Policy and Planning Staff, and I'm responsible for overseeing the development and the implementation of Connect Philadelphia Strategic Transportation Plan. In the last 18 months, a number of firms have launched programs where fleets of privately owned and maintained electric scooters have been deployed in dozens of cities around the country. These fleets are an evolution of the dockless bike share programs which were prevalent last year. For the purposes of this testimony, I will use the term dockless scooters or scooter programs to refer to these businesses. Key characteristics of scooters include they are checked out through a smartphone app, scooters have wheel sizes between six and eight inches, they have an electric motor powered by an onboard battery. Scooters do not have seats and are ridden while standing. Scooters of the common designs are currently not permitted to operate on the roadways within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and are illegal to operate on sidewalks in the city of Philadelphia. Scooter maintenance and battery charging are typically accomplished by fleets of gig economy workers rather than direct employees of the operating firms. Otis is focused on improving tra Philadelphia's transportation system in ways that benefit everyone. We see potential for dockless scooter programs to benefit Philadelphia in two main ways. Through increasing mobility and accessibility for individuals, through improving sustainability through the shift to smaller electric vehicles. We have been in regular contact with many companies that would seek to operate dockless scooters in Philadelphia. Today, all the companies have been transparent with their intentions and dealings with the city of Philadelphia. This open dialogue has been beneficial and has provided us with some understanding of the upsides of dockless scooter programs. However, this mode of transportation is very new. And early reports from our peer cities highlight the potential trade-offs and even the dangers inherent in the dockless scooter programs. Specifically, reports of injury crashes are commonplace in cities where scooter systems have been deployed. Currently, there are few comprehensive studies of crashes involving scooters and little data has been collected to date on national trends. What data does exist points to a popular and novel form of transportation that has shown relatively high risks of crashes and injuries by users. Some points of reference that Otis has considered in making our recommendations today include a study published by Consumer Reports earlier this month, highlighting more than 1,500 serious injuries across 23 medical institutions. Reports of high fatality rates compared with bike share programs. Four scooter-related fatalities across the country in the past year versus two fatalities in nine years of bike share program operation. And conversations with peer agencies in dozens of cities across the country where scooter programs are active. Currently, the Pennsylvania Motor Vehicle Code does not permit the use of the types of electric scooters currently promoted by the firms who are seeking to enter Philadelphia's market. Any action on the city's part will necessarily be subject to permissions at the state level. Last June, City Council passed Bill Number 180429, which defined the City of Philadelphia's role in regulating dockless bikes and scooter programs. 
My office is currently developing regulations that will allow for the de deployment of dockless bike share programs in Philadelphia. We intend to use this regulatory framework to test a number of strategies that may be used to manage dockless scooters at a later date. <coughs> However, it is our recommendation that the City of Philadelphia refrain from promoting or permitting the use of dockless scooter programs until a more thorough analysis of the benefits and the risks to public safety are better understood. We believe that it would be appropriate to revisit this issue in one year's time and would welcome the opportunity to provide council with additional information as it becomes available. Thank you again for the opportunity here today to speak at the hearing for resolution 181113. In summary, OTIS recommends ongoing monitoring and study of the safety impacts of scooters in other cities and revisiting the issue of dockless scooters in 12 months. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Next. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting PennDOT to offer comments on this uh, important emerging mobility topic. My name is Ngani Ndimbye. I'm a policy specialist at PennDOT. Um, it's always good to return to Philadelphia. My sister has lived here for eight years, and so I only wish that you had held this hearing on Friday so I could have been back for the flower show at the same time. But um, the together, Roy Gothi, who's a state bike ped coordinator, and I have been heading up the department's efforts to um, stay on top of the electric scooter issue, and we've diligently been keeping tra tabs on the national conversation as well. So the department is acutely aware of the fact that dockless scooters have been very popular where deployed and also that there have been deaths and serious injuries associated with their use. Um, so we at PennDOT applaud the city's uh, aim of reducing car dependency and increasing the number of affordable and environmentally friendly mobility options. And we think it's prudent to consider electric scooters as a potential piece of that puzzle. Um, but we do have some concerns, as I had mentioned. So today I'll give the highlights of the current legal classification um, of electric scooters, the department's actions thus far, and a legislative update, and our next steps. So one of the challenges of electric scooters is that their current classification at the federal level um, by NHTSA says, defines electric scooter, uh, so similar to what the devices you see in front of us, um, as a device without a seat, a top speed of less than 20 miles per hour, and says that these are not motor vehicles, don't need to have registrations and VIN numbers. At the state level, it is PennDOT's legal interpretation that electric scooters fall into Title 75's definition of a motor vehicle. Thus, electric scooters cannot be operated on roadways or in bike lanes in Pennsylvania. Um, they could be operated on private property. And this designation can only be changed through legislative action. Uh, the limitations of our state statute have given us some time to observe deployments in other states and cities and consider what a rational integration of electric scooters might look like. So in June of 2018, uh, we have, we looked at, uh, we held an internal meeting within PennDOT with other department officials to discuss and refine the issues facing PennDOT and emerging low speed vehicles. Um, we also, our Highway Administration Department within PennDOT has also led a conversation within the Governor's Highway Safety Administration to gather information from DOT, uh, Department of Transportation staff across, across the nation, um, especially in states with, that already have uh, electric scooter deployments. Um, in January, I, I joined other department officials in represent, in, and representatives at a Transportation Research Board workshop about low-speed electric transportation devices. Um, and this meeting featured lots of stakeholders and we're able to gather a lot of perspectives at that as well. And additionally, we've spoken with representatives of electric scooter companies, Lime and Bird, who are, as we know, very interested in deploying electric scooters in Pennsylvania cities. And of course, the department has uh, spoken to uh, officials in the departments of transportation in the cities of Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh. So we've definitely been paying very close attention to the issue. Um, simultaneously, the legislature has been at work. Um, Representatives Rothman and Kinsey sep uh, submitted a co-sponsorship memo indicating their, uh, in in uh, their, in their intention, excuse me, to introduce a bill, and then that bill was introduced yesterday. Um, this bill would make dockless electric scooters uh, able to be legal on our roadways, um, and so that language is very new, and we've seen that. Moving forward, the department, uh, uh, PennDOT, will be given an opportunity to comment on this bill 
now that it's been introduced and offer its position. Um, and we will also continue to be closely monitoring the emerging research about the safety of electric scooters. That's one of the things that we think is a key portion of this. Um, ultimately, our goal as a department is to balance our responsibilities of expanding mobility as, as well as maintaining safety on our roadways. And we're glad to partner with the City of Philadelphia and this committee to achieve those aims. Thank you very much. Next. Good morning, Chairpersons uh, Johnson and Reynolds Brown, well, I guess not here, but, uh, and members of the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities and the Committee on the Environment. I'm Cheryl Bettigal, uh, Director of the Division of Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention with the Public Health Department. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today on the potential health risks and benefits of electric scooters. Electric scooters are still relatively new, so as you've heard, data on their safety is limited as is data on whether they are used to substitute for car trips, decreasing traffic congestion and air pollution. Based on the limited data available, however, I do have concerns about what appears to be a high injury rate. So a study done in two emergency departments in Southern California found that there were more patients with scooter-related injuries, 249, then bicyclist, 195, or pedestrian, 181, injuries during a one-year period. The majority of injuries resulted from falls and collisions with moving vehicles, and most consisted of fractures, head injuries, and contusions. Most injuries were to riders, but there were 21 non-rider pedestrian injuries. Based on a study done by the Portland Department of Transportation, the injury rate per mile traveled was 2.5 per 10,000 electric scooter trips as compared to 0 0.05 injuries per mile traveled by motorcycle and 0.04 injuries per mile traveled by bike share. Assuming that most electric scooter trips are not over one to two miles, this would represent an injury rate 25 to 50 times higher than that for motorcycle riders. There's no national data yet on electric scooter injuries. The CDC has launched a study and that data will be useful in giving us more information about this new travel mode. And my understanding is the results of that study are, are gonna be available in the spring. Too many Philadelphians use cars as their principal means of transportation. This results in traffic congestion, air pollution, and decreased physical activity and helps drive the obesity epidemic. The Philadelphia Department of Public Health supports efforts to diversify our city's transportation options, including a robust public transportation system, the city's strong and growing bike share program, and infrastructure to support safe walking and biking. In the future, electric scooters might well be a valuable part of this array of transportation options. But there's not yet scientific evidence to demonstrate that e-scooter trips take the place of car trips, and there does seem to be a growing body of evidence that they pose significant safety risks. Our recommendation would be to wait, allow the evidence base to grow, and then reassess in a year. During that time, the industry will also have time to assess whether there are changes that need to be made to some e-scooter models to improve safety. Many models currently allow speeds of 15 to 20 miles per hour, and those speeds, coupled with small wheel sizes, may contribute to the risk, the risk of a flip injury if a scooter hits a small bump in the sidewalk or road. Allowing some additional time to pass and re-reviewing the evidence could allow for a safer rollout of this new technology and spare Philadelphians the risk of technology they may still need safety improvements. Thank you for the opportunity to, te to testify. I'll respond to any questions you have. Thank you. Councilman Mark Squilla. Thank you all and thanks for your testimony. Um, is it possible in the future that, and I guess this would be for PennDOT, um, that scooters would eventually be legalized in, this, in the Commonwealth? Yep, there was a bill introduced yesterday that would legalize the use of scooters on, on roadways and bike lanes. And if, if they're legalized, is it possible that they would start being used without any regulations in place? Um, the bill would allow, um, the bill is not so different than the for example, the, um, uh, the law that allows electric bikes, um, e-bikes on our roads, so electric assist bikes on our roads. So, um, and there aren't a, a lot of regulations that guide those. Um, do you have an addition? So, Councilman. Um, Just state your name again. Yeah, Chris Pahalski, Otis. Um, 
they, they would certainly, you know, if legalized, it's my understanding that they'd certainly be able to use by private individuals with privately owned scooters, but that a, any kind of shared mobility dockless program um, that operated in the city of Philadelphia would still need to be um, approved subject to the regulations that we're writing, um, working on writing right now and that were enabled by the legislation passed last year. Sorry, I wasn't sure what you meant by regulations. Okay, so yes, regs, I thought you meant regs written on behalf of the department or like at the federal level, which in which case, no. Yes, um, there would be permitting, all of those types of things would be run here by, by the city, so, or any given city. So parking, um, permitting, other things would be decided and, and. I guess, Chris, this would be for you. Um, so I know we're in the process of looking at a policy for uh, dockless uh, bikes. Um, as that rolls out, and safety is a major issue, but the other issue and concern was the clutter, uh, the, where you park them, how they're locked, and things like that. And as we move forward, and this, is there a timeline when that bike policy will be out? Yeah, so it's, it's currently in the law department. We hope within the next month or two to be able to um, um, uh, issue those those regulations or send them over to the Roll department it could be a year or two yes well um, <laughs> it, you, you have been diligent about pressing us um, to to get them out and I apologize that our office has not been able to issue those regulations already but um, it, it, I think the clutter issue is was one of the um, really initial sources of concern both with, with the dockless bikes and the dockless scooter companies um, the I think the companies have been good about innovating um, finding solutions to some of the clutter problems. I think it's still an issue that needs to be managed. Um, but I, I, for me, that's not really like, I don't think that's the game changer. I think the real critical issues are the safety problems that we mentioned and then the environmental issues, whether these um, devices substitute for car trips or whether they substitute for trips that would otherwise be taken by walking and biking. Those, those to me are the biggest issues. I think the clutter I think the clutter issue is something that um, we need to pay attention to, but I think we, we, I, I have some hope that we could manage it if, if it's properly resourced. And I think if it's, if it's done properly and there is a policy that both the bike share folks and uh, the city can work together with, I think there's some place that we could manage it. Um, do you see, if the state passes this and somehow becomes legal? Is it something that we should be looking at in the future to see how we could regulate these just like we're doing with bike share in case they do ever become legal? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think it all depends on the timing of the state legislation of when it's passed through both houses and when it's signed by the governor. I think in our ideal world, we would like to get six to 12 months of experience in um, working with dockless bike share companies before um, opening to dockless uh, scooter companies. Um, but we don't have, any, we don't have anything firm, firmly established on that. But I, I think the dockless bikes are probably a little bit easier to manage. Um, so that's, that's why we'd like to get some experience working with that animal before we would move to scooters. But we just have to wait and see the timing, whether it you know, passes lightning speed or it you know, um, proceeds through the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had a question um, for Cheryl from the Department of Health. Can you just clarify why you think um, the scooters are um, more, I think, uh, just to summarize what you said, I guess more dangerous than, or less, safe, less safer than other modes of transportation? So why is always hard to pull out of data? What we're looking at is, um, in, and these are relatively small studies and relatively few of them, so we may see a different pattern later. Um, what's been seen so far looks like more injuries than you'd expect. So, so the two ERs in Southern California, you know, we don't know exactly how many scooter trips there have been in that vicinity compared to the number of people traveling by bike um, or walking, but I'd be surprised if there are more people using scooters than bikes. And in that case, seeing more scooter injuries than bike injuries is worrisome. Now, maybe that's wrong, and maybe there's been a, a really hot trend in that vicinity on scooters. Maybe that's one particular brand that's having trouble. It's hard to know what, what the cause of that is. Okay. I just wanted to see what was that, the correlation in terms of comparison. Councilman Derek Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question for the panel. Um, 
in those states where you've seen some of the studies, uh, is there any restrictions on device speed of those scooters? I, I believe the companies all, all regulate the, the scooter speed themselves, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't know for sure for all the cities, whether it's Texas um, or, or California are the two um, states where we've looked at the most. I know in Texas, um, individual cities are almost entirely preempted from any kind of control over the, over the um, management of dockless programs. And I, so I'm, I'm guessing it's 15 to 20, but I, I can't stay, say on the record. Yeah, I'm just reflecting a testimony from uh, the representative here from Department of Transportation, and it indicates that there's no restrictions on device speed in California and Texas. Uh, however, the legislation introduced in Harrisburg um, just yesterday, I believe, maxes the device speed at 15, uh, from my understanding. I, I believe it's 20. The bill that I read was a, a top speed of 20 miles an hour um, when I looked at the draft yesterday. The, the bill restricts the the, the map, it defines an electric scooter as being the uh, device where the max speed that the device is capable of going on like a flat land at 20 miles, but it also uh, defines or says that the operator cannot uh, carry the device at, at more than 15 miles per hour. So more I guess- what, a, Can you restate that more so, than- um, The defines the, uh, scooter, so the definition of an electric scooter um, within the bill is a device that can go up to 20 miles per hour on, um, right. but then it also states within the bill that you ca you cannot draw, actually use it at above 15 miles per hour. You can operate faster than 15. Correct. Okay, that was my understanding. Okay, yeah. so just looking at what the information provided, um, is, although the studies are still in its infancy, there's a good possibility that in those studies that were done in California and Texas, part of the challenge and part of the reason for the accidents could be the fact that they do not have the maximum speed that's allowed, even though the um, vehicles can go up to 20 miles per hour based on the manufacturer's um, capabilities, but people have decided to drive up to the max, even though there may not be any max speed restrictions in those jurisdictions. Sure, I, I think though that the, the devices that are deployed by, and I, and I think Bird and Lime will be able to tell you, I, I do think a lot of those, or at least some of those um, crashes have happened on their scooters, and I believe their scooters have a top speed of, of 15 or, or something around there. So, um, well, I, well, your, your own information does not reflect that as a maximum device speed. It says it's open based on your testimony. Right. So it's, good, it's very possible that Part of the reason for those unfortunate incidents is that those states chose not to have a maximum speed limit, and so people are um, using the scooters at a higher rate of speed, which may cause the increase in possible injuries, as opposed to what we're looking here in the Commons, Pennsylvania, stating that you cannot use a scooter past 15 miles per hour, which would possibly restrict some of those um, injuries. But it's still early to tell um, based on the studies. Um, I just think that to say that these um, vehicles are more prone to cause injuries is somewhat challenging considering that the data is still inconclusive because we're still in the very infancy of studies. Uh, I'll defer to the chair. Yeah, I, I, I think, Councilman, you bring up a lot of good points and a lot of good questions and that we don't have all the answers here today. I think that's um, kind of the summary of our recommendations is that we, we do wait until there's a more definitive basis of facts and data to make good policy in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. Thank you. Chris, in terms of the dockless bikes, right, I know they have electrical ones and the ones that aren't electric. Do we know the speed limit for the ones that are electric? And have we done studies to see our individuals injury prone when it comes to them utilizing the electric bikes? Because yes. I know that's the next phase yes. that the administration is looking at. Have we done a study? We, we, we have not done a study. I know in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You said you haven't done a study? We have not, we, we have not done a study. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, I believe electric bikes are limited to 25 miles per hour. Um, but for I believe for our Indigo electric bikes, we have a top speed of, 
um, somewhere around 15, but I can, I can get that fact back to you. And we would, we would be looking to something similar for any dockless program that we permitted for bikes, a top speed of around 15, which is enough to you know, accelerate and get close to the speed of, of traffic. And so we, we, we've seen some evidence that being able to accelerate quickly and get up to a speed of traffic is one of the safety benefits of electric assist bicycles. <coughs> Have your team done an analysis to look at The impact of not only scooters, but um, obviously we have bike shares and the dockless motorbikes and its impact on uh, how we address congestion here in the city of Philadelphia, because I think I mentioned early on, I live in Point Breeze, which since I've been a kid and we were coming downtown before Alan Dom developed all of Center City <laughs> as a kid and hang out in Rittenhouse Square, and that's like a 10 minute walk, but um, any event that I'm riding into, work, um, it may take me close to some days half an hour to 45 minutes. One, one day I had to go to 30th Street <laughs> to get back down to um, 20th Market just because of so much of the construction that was going on and the congestion of cars. But just want to get an idea um, from you, um, how have we looked at congestion as it relates to these types of vehicles? Yeah, congestion is Congestion benefits are certainly um, one of the primary reasons is that, that we think um, we're trying to build a high quality bike network so that everyone in our city from eight to 80, all ages and abilities can use um, bicycles for transportation. And we've seen that there's definitely a congestion benefit. And then for our Indigo um, the, uh, bike, docked bike program, we see there's definitely uh, an improvement on parking situations so that you know, one parking spot might just be used by one person during the course of the day, but typically, you know, that, uh, if we put an indigo station in there, that's used by seven, eight, nine, ten people during the day, so definitely improvement on congestion um, and parking. All right, thank you. Councilman Allen Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question for, uh, is it Mr. Puchalski? Um, have we done a study, a traffic study, of the city, center city specifically, because it is a mess, as, as uh, Councilman Johnson is talking about. To get around the city is very, very challenging. And also, our city has very narrow streets. So, um, you know, in the backdrop from six years ago, now 20 to 25 percent of all purchases are over the internet, which means more delivery trucks. And it's just challenging, more Uber and Lyft. So, my question is for safety reasons, have we done a study, a traffic study? And can we incorporate that to make sure that bike lanes are safer? If we do the scooters, that's safer. We may have to suspend some on-street parking. Because, I mean, think about it. What do we get per hour for the meter? Eight or ten dollars or something? That's pretty valuable real estate that probably should be freed up so cars can go through. Are we, do are we doing a study? So I, I think we haven't done a comprehensive study of everything together, but we have done individual studies on the various efforts that you've talked about. Um, I believe the revenue from a parking spot in Center City is $10,000 per year. Um, I, w w you're right, we need more loading. There's more parcel delivery now than there ever has been before, and we need to innovate with our loading solutions. So our office is um, trying to work on some solutions to that. Um, I think one of the issues is the enforcement of the current laws. So we did the enforcement blitz on Market and, Ch uh, Market and Chestnut Street, and um, we've been um, seen that that had a positive impact, but some of the fines are just too low and that the delivery vehicles are just willing to take the fine. So we need to have an appropriate system of, of carrots and sticks, if you will. We need, we need to provide people safe and legal spaces to conduct their business and then encourage them when there is an open spot to use that open spot for loading. We, you don't know how many times I've seen a delivery, pe delivery vehicle blocking an, a, a moving traffic lane when there is an open delivery spot loading zone on that very block. So we, I don't think we quite have the same, uh, the, the, the right system yet. So all our office is working on developing some new ideas that we're not ready to publicize yet, but, but to address some of the loading issues. And then finally, we're working on promoting transit so that people can efficiently move around um, Center City in a safe and environmentally friendly way. That's, that's one of our biggest efforts, both for safety and congestion, is promoting public transportation. But you know, here's where we're going. In 10 years from now, there could be 40 to 50 percent of the purchases are over the internet. So there'll be more and more and more delivery trucks. So my suggestion, I asked this last year, to do a complete traffic study and incorporate these other ideas that we want to incorporate to see how we can blend everything together. But I think we need that complete study. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that this is cer certainly a need that we need to, need to examine and look at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions from, from members of the panel? Councilman Dak Green? Yes, just wanted to follow up on statements earlier that was made, and I believe it's a recommendation of Otis to um, wait a year. That, yeah. um, now, my understanding the legislation has been introduced in Harrisburg, um, if that le which was just yesterday. So if that legislation were to be passed in this legislative session, would um, the position of Otis change? I, I, I think we just have to wait and see what the timing is of what the legislation um, of how clearly that legislation passes. I, I th and, and we're going to, so we'll continue to monitor that and we'll also continue to monitor the, the information that comes out. And like Cheryl said, the CDC study that's being done, I believe, on Austin should come out this spring. So I, hopefully we'll get some more information, um, even if the, um, the bill should pass soon um, by the time it passes. Right, but I could about reiter reiterate my question. If the legislation were to pass by the end of the spring session, would that change the perspective of Otis in reference to suggesting we wait a year if the Commonwealth has um, approved the ability to use e-scooters in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I don't think I can give you a definite answer. I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I hope the state legislature looks at all the information, the data, both on the very positive impacts about these devices and also the potential downfalls when they make their decision. But regardless, we, we want to make sure that we're looking at all the data before we make the decision that's right to Philadelphia. I, there, there's just so frequently the decision that's right for the rest of the state is not necessarily right for Philadelphia. And we, we, need, we need the decision and the policy for transportation and our narrow streets with the densest part in the state that's right for us. And maybe what's good for Erie, what's good, I think it was gonna be Cumberland County was the legislator that introduced the bill, was his district. What's right for those districts might not be what's exactly right for Philadelphia. Well, that's clearly the case considering we're the only City of the first class in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but I guess my perspective, considering that you're already viewing other cities who already have um, e-scooters in their jurisdictions, uh, who've come up with regulations, uh, even from PennDOT, they've already analyzed what other states have done from a legislative perspective. Uh, considering this is a new form of transportation, uh, wouldn't it make some sense to move forward with some type of concept, even if it's just a pilot, uh, in that regard? if it becomes legal in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and the reason I say that is so often when we look at Philadelphia, we're trying to put Philadelphia in a new light in that we're trying to be more progressive in a number of different things uh, and being more open for new technologies, new ideas, new perspectives. And so from my perspective, it would help to continue what we've been trying to do over the past number of years is put Philadelphia in a more progressive light in a number of ways and to not at least identify some means of trying to do what some of our um, competitor cities are doing and at least try to study the perspective in ways of maybe a pilot or something in that regard if the legislation does get passed. Yeah. So. Um, I, I think for, for me, the important part is to make sure we separate new from progressive. And we certainly want to be progressive, whether that's uh, enabling people to make trips without an automobile, saving people's lives no matter how they get around, and reducing the environmental impact of our um, transportation system, and doing that all equitably to make sure that everyone is receiving the benefits and also that the disbenefits of our transportation system don't fall on any one particular group. And, and um, the dockless scooters are certainly new, the electric scooters are certainly new, and what we need to do is wait and get the data to make sure they're progressive. And, and if, if, if in a year from now, um, you know, the data comes out and that they not only help people get around, but they do it safely and they do it in a way that replaces car trips, we will, Otis will be the biggest cheerleader for these devices. But if, you know, the data is, is otherwise and that they substitute trips that would have otherwise been made by walking and that they re in increase deaths and serious injuries, then I think that's worth knowing before we, um, you know, make any firm policy. Uh, and I think the, you know, the, the fortunate thing about being a second mover is that we, that we get, we're going to get lots of data without having to risk any potential um, negative impacts on our residents from legalizing these things before we know that they're truly progressive. And I think to answer your question, it's just too early to say definitely whether Otis will change its position um, should the legislation pass in the spring. Well, I guess I'm somewhat um, confusing your commentary in reference to excuse me, making a distinction between new versus progressive. Uh, I would think that something that is using an electric power source would be progressive. I understand the concern in reference to 
um, safety for the residents of the city of Philadelphia, but I would, I would believe you would think that other cities and states um, that have decided to move forward electric scooters are also concerned about the safety concerns for their own residents. Uh, I'm just interesting that you would make the distinction between new versus progressive when a vehicle that's being powered with electric, an electric source, I would think most people would agree that would be a progressive form of transportation because it's not a carbon-based energy source. Yeah, uh, and, if, and if the trip that someone would take would have been made by an automobile and it's instead made by an electric scooter, then that is definitely progressive. But if the trip is one that would be taken by bicycle or that would have been taken by walking, then you would see an increase in emissions um, by the substitution of a walking or bicycle trip, which is also, you know, uh, it's only the food you eat um, versus one that's made by an electric scooter. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will close with this. I would think that from most people's understanding, um, if your ability to walk, and I'm someone that, as many people know, get up very early at the crack of dawn to run, uh, as well as row on the school on the school as well, uh, most people that use some type of transportation, uh, if they can walk, they generally should walk. Uh, I would venture, and I think most people probably in this room would agree, and that if someone's going to use an e-scooter, there's probably a distance further than they normally would walk or possibly bike. Uh, so I think the concept that a e-scooter is somewhat new but not somewhat progressive is somewhat interesting concept, but I will defer to the chair uh, for the rest of the hearing. You got a progressive administration, so I'm not sure if that adds up, but I'm going to pass to Councilman Allen Dahm. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One quick question. The $10,000 per spot, where does that revenue go? Mm. That goes to the parking authority, and then um, I understand that about... Um, after they take out their costs, about um, just under 30% goes to the city and the balance goes to the school district. But you'd, um, I think it, I'm not probably not the right person to, to give you the exact figures um, on that. But that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Dom. Um, can the, thank you very much. Can the clerk please call the next panel? Paul White and Sherry Shapiro. Please state your name for the record and begin. I'm Sherry Shapiro, and I'm the director of Mid-Atlantic Government Relations for Lime, at the electric bike and scooter company. Free of charge to communities, Lime provides a network of dockless shared transportation options, including bikes and the scooters you see here. It's hard to comprehend how popular scooters have become. I heard one of the uh, previous testifiers say, if these become popular, then maybe we will bring them to Philadelphia. Um, Lime launched in 2017. In the past two years, we've provided more than 35 million rides. We serve more than 100 communities, including most major US cities, like Washington, DC, Baltimore, who you'll hear for, from in a minute, Detroit, Providence, Cincinnati, Los Angeles, Dallas, Portland, Charlotte, and more. In just the past two weeks, without any solicitation from us, more than 600 Philadelphians have written in to share why they want electric scooters here. A constituent in your district uh, Chairman Johnson, um, no, I'm sorry, a constituent in Vice Chairman Squilla's district expresses it this way. It will be awesome and save me time and money. People around the world are choosing scooters not only because they're easy and affordable, but because they are fun. But perhaps more importantly, Philadelphians themselves believe that scooters will help our entrenched challenges 
like equitable access to transportation, congestion, decreasing use of public transportation, and pollution. Reducing congestion has been a significant um, interest of this council. A constituent from President Clark's district told us that he would be able to ditch the car and use Lyme to get around the city and then train for trips out of the city. Another person noted that scooters provide an affordable alternative to driving my car short distances. A constituent from uh, your district, Councilman Johnson, um, says it this way. After trying Lyme in Texas, I started to imagine how, it would be le how I would be less inclined to use rideshare in Philly. Rideshare services would have led to hopelessly clogged streets all over the city. Our data confirms this. 30% of our riders in major markets took a scooter instead of using a personal car. A Queen Village resident explains how this would work. I live one mile away from the closest metro stop. It's not practical for me to walk there, um, therefore I drive. The last mile commute feature of Lyme addresses an unmet need in public transportation in Philadelphia. I hope that Philly continues to be a model of public transit and allows Lyme to come to this city very soon. Safety is Lyme's highest priority. But let's talk about how we make scooters safe. Because it is not hard to do. It is the responsibility of our companies to make scooters as safe as we can. Right here, we have our newest model of scooters. We've done it with safety in mind. We've made the tires larger so that they can go over potholes and um, address the bumpiness of streets. We've made them heavier, so they have a lower center of gravity. Made the uh, footboard wider, so people have an easier time um, putting their feet. And we've put a screen on it to make sure that we can put messages in, like wear a helmet. I think both of our companies send helmets to anyone who writes to us and, uh, and asks. Cedar sinai Medical Center had these recommendations. They looked at the data and they said, scooters, like any motorized vehicle or bike, can be used safely by taking common sense measures. In addition to helmets, start off slowly. The accelerator and braking tabs on the handles can take getting used to. Be mindful of surrounding traffic, especially at intersections. No one-handed rides. Put down that phone and the coffee cup. No headphones or earbuds while operating the scooter. Don't try to operate the scooter if you've been drinking alcohol. Be mindful of your safety and the safety of others. Be alert to pedestrians and other vehicles. Make sure to leave the scooter out of the way of foot traffic so it doesn't create a tripping hazard. These are things that we are not only happy but excited to work with the city on to make sure that Philadelphians are educated in how to use scooters safely. We have an entire campaign called Respect the Ride that we can localize here. We also know that we need to make the city streets safer for everyone. The fatalities that um, the uh, previous testifiers talked about were encounters with cars. In one case, the driver um, was uh, allegedly on drugs at the time. This is not to minimize the injuries that happen on our scooters. That doesn't look good for us, and it makes people afraid. And that's the last thing we want to do. But what I think that we need to do is to make our streets safer for everyone. We support policies that dedicate a per-ride fee to the city to dedicate it to infrastructure to make the street safer. I have been very involved in, Vision, in the Vision Zero Alliance here in the city um, with Lyme support to make the street safer for everyone and to reduce vehicle crashes to zero. I have a couple of numbers here to put 
um, the scooter statistics in context. 103 people were killed in traffic in 2016. In 2007, 96 people were killed. That's here in Philadelphia, not nationwide. Um, 40 of whom were pedestrians and three of whom were cyclists. So that gives you a sense of the um, environment in which we are traveling every day as we walk down the street, as we drive down the street. Scooters have the opportunity to take people out of cars, about 30%, as I said, and to give them a different form of transportation, and one that is more equitable. Transportation equity, as um, uh, Councilman Green mentioned, is of high priority here in Philadelphia. People are not equally served by transit, and they're not equally served by um, modes like bike share. Those are mostly here in Center City. What dockless vehicles, including bikes and scooters, allow people to do is pick up the vehicle wherever they are, find it on an app, pick it up, and take it to wherever they want to go. Then it's our responsibility to make sure that those vehicles are redistributed where people need them. The data from Washington, D.C. and New York have shown that scooters and electric bikes increase the equity and our ridership skews both more female and more minority than traditional bike share programs. The last thing I'm going to say is not in my written testimony. I was a tech entrepreneur here for many years. What I found is that Philadelphia is behind its peers on almost every measure. We need to inspire other cities. We need to show them how we can do this well and safely, how we can get the best out of dockless electric scooters. We could wait, or we could do a pilot here working with us, taking the best from the other cities, but also the best from the health commissioner, from CHOP, from the fantastic universities that we have here, and make our scooter program the best in the country that other cities are looking to and saying, wow, we've had these problems. Let's look at what Philadelphia did. We want to inspire. We want to push this type of technology forward in a way that allows everyone in our city to have better access to transportation, that allows us to reach our climate goals, and that shows us to be the most innovative and progressive in the words of Councilman Green. Thank you. Thank you. Please touch your testimony. Thank you, council members, uh, in particular, council member Johnson, uh, council member Green. Um, I'm uh, extremely appreciative of the opportunity to testify today. My name is Paul Steely White. I am the safety policy and advocacy director at Bird Rides. And uh, I'm here today to address a few of the key concerns that, uh, that we've heard. Um, you know, Bird created this industry less than two years ago for the simple mission of replacing car trips, reducing carbon emissions, making communities more livable. Uh, we've learned a lot in the past year and a half. Um, we are, you know, responsive to cities' needs, and, and really what we're finding is that the low speed, the low, sp the low power of our scooters, the way that they're integrating with public transit, um, the way that the demand is just, you know, demonstrable in city after city, um, is showing that we're really onto something here. Um, now, I want to talk about safety because that was really, um, I think, the main topic of the earlier panel. Uh, in fact, what we are finding through the independent research that's being conducted and through our own internal research is that e-scooter sharing is as safe, if not safer, than bicycling. Now, I want to repeat that because that seems to be contradictory to some of what we heard this morning. E-scooter sharing is as safe or, sa or safer than bicycling. Now, the three studies that were mentioned earlier, we heard mention of the Portland study, the UCLA Medical Center study, and the Consumer Report study. Now, the Portland study, 40 pages long, um, really um, very detailed. They looked at more than 700,000 e-scooter shared trips in Portland over a four-month period. They found three times more injuries on bicycles than scooters 
in that study. Now, they also looked at volumes, because as was pointed out earlier, it's really important to understand relative risk, risk exposure. You have to look at volume. They looked at volumes. They looked at injury severity. And the conclusion of that study was very, very clear. In fact, it was written by the local health authority in Portland. And the conclusion was that there was no disproportionate risk for e-scooter sharing. It was in line with the risk for bicycling. And in fact, and this is also in this study very clearly, there is a safety benefit to the extent that e-scooters are replacing car trips. And in Portland, that number was 34%. 34% of e-scooter trips in Portland were trips that would have otherwise been taken by a private car, an Uber, or a Lyft. So to say that there hasn't been study or conclusions around these issues, I think, you know, the, the research is out there. We just have to make sure that we're reading it and reporting it correctly. The UCLA Medical Center study found two severe injuries over a year and over millions of e-scooter share trips, approximately 4 million. Now, that rate of injury, of severe injury, 2 per 4 million, or in other words, 0.5 severe injuries per million uh, miles ridden on a scooter is actually much better than the national rate for bicycling, uh, s severe injuries for bicycling. So I think we can all agree that there needs to be more study, um, but it is untrue that e-scooter sharing is proving to be disproportionately dangerous. Um, in fact, the, the research is telling a different story. Just quickly, the Consumer Reports story that found 1,500 injuries, those, those injuries were not in fact serious injuries. As was stated earlier, those were just injuries, most of them very minor. And that, again, was 1,500 injuries nationwide over a year, over more than 50 million shared e-scooter trips. So there are now more shared e-scooter trips than bike share trips in America. Um, the history of bike in the, the history of bike Thank you, thank you. Um, and so, you know, looking at that injury rate, we're actually doing better than bicycling. Um, and also, by the way, there were four and a half million injuries that were car-related in America over that same period. 500,000 bicycle injuries and 100,000 pedestrians. So that helps contextualize the 1,500 that was reported. The car trip repra replacement number that Portland found, 34%, that's proving true in other cities. I was just in Coral Gables uh, yesterday, um, and they're finding 30% of their e-scooter trips are trips that would have otherwise been taken by private car. Denver, um, Dallas, many other cities finding that same number. So this is a significant finding. So in fact, e-scooter sharing is making streets safer, reducing carbon, and really I think that's that elusive trip re replacement uh, grail that we've all been searching for for years that e-scooters are providing. So, you know, that's central to our mission, right? Because um, if we're going to win the battle against climate change, we have to figure this out. And it's also true that everyone should be able to participate in this battle against carbon emissions. And that's why at Bird, like with our leading competitors, we are committed to equity and we are making sure that affordability is never a barrier to anyone who wants to use an e-scooter who wants to join the fight against climate change. And so we have a number of strategies where we make our e-scooters accessible and affordable for all city residents. And that's really key. And we look forward to working with the city to make that happen. Dockless electric scooter sharing systems have been implemented successfully, as was pointed out, and safely in hundreds of cities. And I mentioned, you know, Portland's example of finding no disproportionate risk. I really want to hammer that point because, again, it's really the most exhaustive study that's been done. Please look at it. In conclusion, I just want to say that, you know, right now, Philadelphia has the opportunity to take the lead in this movement and actually beat New York and Chicago in embracing e-scooters. There's a majority of New York council members who now support uh, the, the legalization bill for e-scooters. We'll see what the mayor says. Um, but, you know, New York's definitely gaining momentum, but I think um, Philly can definitely be first. You know, legislation has been introduced, um, you know, HB 631 in Harrisburg to amend the state vehicle code, which will empower cities to offer a greater range of transportation options by clarifying regulations around e-scooters. We urge you to support its swift passage. In the meantime, we request the city council support to enact a shared scooter program in Philadelphia as soon as possible, even if on a pilot or a limited basis. Together, we are confident that we can make Philadelphia a safer, more innovative, more climate-friendly than ever before. We hope you will join us in this important mission. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Councilman Mark Squilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's possible for the chair, if you could um, forward those Portland studies and uh, other studies that you have, we could share them with our, our departments and uh, 
Um, we notice, we know from studies, we have a lot of studies that say opposite things from different folks. Um, so we always have to look at both sides of every argument and then uh, come to a conclusion. Um, I actually rode the, the scooters. It, it was fun, you know, and, uh, but we want to make sure it is safe and we want to make sure that it, it's also uh, the quality of life issues as far as where they will be parked and stored and things like that is also a concern. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point where I think we need to, to look at that. If this does pass, we want to be ready for it. Uh, we don't want <clears throat> other people just coming in and, and, and putting these on our streets without having a guidelines in place. And, uh, you know, will there be private electric scooters? There are already private electric scooters out there riding the streets today, um, just like there are electric bikes. And um, we, need, we need more modes of transportation, and we need to consider that. So uh, I think any information that you could give to the chair and to us uh, as far as studies, and we can compare that to, you know, other studies, and then hopefully be in place once this passes in Pennsylvania to come up with some. Absolutely, we will furnish you with those studies. Um, actually, tomorrow um, I'm meeting with the lead researcher on the UCLA study that was done, and they want to do a follow-up looking more closely at actual injury severity and also volumes, comparing volumes. Um, and they're doing another study in Oakland in partnership with the local Department of Transportation there. So I think we're going to find out a lot more moving forward, but there's enough data now, I think, to indicate that scooters are safe, um, about as safe as bicycling, and um, as was, um, I think, very eloquently said earlier, we know how to make it safer, right? We know that, like, for example, of the four deaths that we've seen nationwide, three of them have occurred at 3 a.m., and they all involved cars, right? And so I think looking at the operational parameters of scooter sharing, we, you know, we might want to say we don't want scooters operating at 3 a.m., um, and, you know, keeping kids off scooters is also very important. You know, at Bird, we require proof of age before people get on our scooters. And, you know, there are other things we can do. And then, of course, looking back to infrastructure, I think we could all agree that, you know, there's much to be done in New York, as in Philadelphia, to, like, make streets safer. Vision Zero is a terrific initiative. In New York, 100 fewer people are dying compared to four years ago because of Vision Zero and those street changes that have been happening. Um, but Philly has made great strides, and if you look at what People for Bikes, you know, the National Bike Advocacy Group ranks Philadelphia actually very highly on the top quintile of American cities in terms of bike friendliness and safety. And those numbers actually line up to our internal uh, safety incident report. So in other words, you know, we have reason to believe that Philly would actually be a safer city compared to many other cities that are currently operating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the Streets Department, Councilman Mark Squilla. Any other questions for our panel? Thank you very much. I want to point you, you have two studies that I provided to the council, one on equity and the other on uh, environmental impact. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Can the clerk please call the next panel? Dr. Megan Ryerson, Liz Cornish, Sarah Clark-Stewart, and Nick Zuiala rogers Thank you. Please state your name for the record and you can begin. Hello, Sarah Clark Stewart, Executive Director of the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia. Should I just keep going? Okay. So um, thank you very much, uh, Council, uh, Councilman Kenyatta Johnson and, and Chair um, and all the other councilmen here. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Um, I have submitted my testimony. I don't want to read it. I know that in the interest of time, I will just try to hit the high points. Um, uh, but I do want to, you know, um, there are two very important plans that um, Philadelphia has to make our streets safer um, and to uh, wean um, and to make our city more sustainable. Connect, which is the 2018 transportation plan that Mayor Kenny uh, put out and the Philadelphia Greenworks plan. And there's two very important values there that I do think are relevant here for this issue that we're talking about with respect to e-scooters. One is that the city, uh, Mayor Kenny does want to make um, our city's transportation system safe for all users and provide opportunity and access. Those are two of the four values. Um, and the Greenworks plan has a very important uh, value of um, providing safe access to affordable and low carbon transportation. 
Um, and so we do believe, as the Bicycle Coalition, that electric bicycles and scooters, um, which is the topic of today's hearing, do offer considerable promise to support these public policy values. Um, and in particular, dockless systems of scooters, e-scooters, and e-bicycles could enhance transportation options and access in neighborhoods that really need them the most. And that's what I want to emphasize today. These are the neighborhoods where motor vehicles in transit are generally the only means of transportation available, um, where bicycles are not commonly used for transportation, and where low-cost options such as um, docked bike share are not yet available. Um, so we know that um, the city's bike share system has been very, very successful um, and, uh, and, and fantastic, but it's unfortunately not all throughout the entire city, as you know. There are neighborhoods such as Southwest Philadelphia, West Germantown, East and West Mount Airy, and the Northeast that have not yet benefited from docked bike share. And that's what dockless electric bikes and e-scooters could really do for those neighborhoods is bring in a new transportation option that they don't currently enjoy. And I did uh, also submit um, a letter that we recently sent to Mayor Kenny urging him to release the regulation and permit that would allow electric bike, dockless electric bikes to be piloted. Um, um, we think that's really needed to, be, to happen as soon as possible. Um, and this is going to help the city really understand how to pilot these kinds of this kind of new technology. Um, I would say that while um, you know we are a bicycle organization, scooters are really new. These are new to us also. Um, but a lot of the problems that that we face and, and work on and advocate for with respect to making bicycling safer and more available to people, those are the same, kind, same kinds of issues that need solutions that for, for e-scooters. Um, in particular, uh, you know, making sure that our streets and roadways are as safe and as good repair as possible. Um, one important difference is that scooters appear to have a lower threshold of acceptance among people who don't already bike. So for, um, and the survey conducted by the Portland Bureau of Transportation that was mentioned earlier, um, that survey had two really interesting uh, results. That 74% of users of scooters reported never having used the city's bike share system, and 42% had never biked. So the potential for people who, to use a slow moving uh, electric vehicle that, um, and not use a car for a short trip, it's really potential there and it's worth testing out. Um, and one statistic I wanna sort of leave with you is that one quarter of trips that are under two miles in Philadelphia are taken by a car. So cutting down that number from one quarter to 20% or 15 or 10 is really an imperative for sustainability and for safety. Um, that number is, quarter is way too high, and it is the status quo, and there's going to have to be something done in a big way to make a difference to cut that down. Um, the last um, other, so we, so we do support piloting electric scooters. We do think there's a lot of um, best practices that other cities have learned that Philadelphia can learn from and that we want to make sure are incorporated in any pilot that um, that Philadelphia pursues. One is that the revenue generated by these, these systems, a portion of that should go back to the streets department to help make the, the city streets in better repair and safer. Um, we have been urging Mayor Kenny to put more money into the streets department to maintain our Vision Zero projects and our bike lanes. Um, that is another letter that we have uh, uh, attached. Um, we need another line item specifically for that, those kinds of maintenance issue, uh, you know, practices in order to make our, system, our bikeway system um, as safe as possible. I think I'll end it there and allow the rest of the panel to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Morning. State, state your name and begin. Sure. Uh, Nick Zuala Rogers. I'm the Transportation Program Director for the Clean Air Council. Um, thanks for allowing me to submit our testimony today. I also submitted a longer version of this. I'll try to give you a, a quicker version. Thank you. Um, so the Council is an environmental organization with a mission to protect everyone's right to a healthy environment. Um, council works to promote biking, walking, and public transportation as a solution to the city's congestion and air quality problems. <clears throat> 
Council is very interested in exploring whether or not electric scooters, scooters <coughs> can be a potential sustainable, safe, equitable, and transparent transportation option in Philadelphia. The transportation sector in the United States makes up roughly 30% of greenhouse gas pollution, and a large portion of that comes from personal vehicles. Public transportation, bikes, and walking are well-known long-term alternatives to replace car trips. The council is excited to see a new low emission mode emerge as another potential alternative that could take more people uh, in cars off the road. In Cincinnati and in Portland, uh, as was referenced earlier, um, where these cities have done their own research on scooter usage, their surveys are showing that roughly a third of scooter trips uh, replace either a personal car or an Uber or a Lyft. Um, getting people out of cars and onto scooters could be a great way to address congestion and air quality here. Um, just a quick anecdote I want to add is our office had the opportunity to test ride a scooter uh, in our hallway, actually, of our building last week. Uh, and um, the, I can tell you that the joy that it brought uh, a group of adults uh, was really remarkable. Um, and uh, that, that's humorous, but it also shouldn't be discounted. Um, in my experience, uh, getting people to switch modes to sustainable transportation. Um, I can tell you that no one makes mobility choices based on what's good for the environment as much as I want them to. Um, that's not a, uh, a you know, decision maker for people. Um, they make their decision based on what gets them there the fastest uh, or what's the cheapest. Um, so fun is really you know, another part of this equation that we have the opportunity to influence people's choices. Um, so the council is supportive of the potential benefits of electric scooters and looks forward to these innovative companies working with the city's transportation office to come up with solutions to the issues that I'm raising today. Um, so with that, I just want to lay out a couple of the concerns that we have um, and that I'm confident can be handled before we bring scooters into the city. The first issue is sustainability. Uh, it's not enough for the trip itself to be a uh, low emission electric trip. Um, the company should have an overall commitment to sustainability and uh, that should be reflected in their business practice. Um, so two points are critical here. First, the energy source for the electric trips should be renewable either through credits or through the grid itself. Uh, and second, the companies operating in Philadelphia should commit to disposing of their waste sustainably and recycling all of it. No scooters used in Philadelphia should end up in a landfill. And that's really important um, because of how many there are. Uh, the batteries and other electric components should be dealt with through sustainable e-waste practices. Uh, and all the other parts should be recycled or reused. Um, they could be sold off to have people build them back up in the city. Um, but because of the high turnover of electric scooters, we're currently uh, a scooter doesn't make it more than a year. I think the, the new versions might last about a year. Um, that's a lot of environmental waste, uh, and the companies need to uh, deal with that uh, in, in, a, you know, in an appropriate way. Um, so next, the scooters uh, should come, that are coming here should be a part of our Vision Zero goals. Scooters um, should be an active partner in making our streets safer, as Sarah mentioned. Um, you know, that includes contributing a portion of their fees to safer streets projects. Um, it could also include preventing dangerous sidewalk use and using automated enforcement to prevent uh, leaving scooters in inappropriate places that uh, inhibit pedestrians. Um, and then. Uh, also on safety, the scooters themselves need to be safe and the city can help regulate that. 83% uh, of the uh, scooter injuries in Portland were the scooter only. They were the only vehicle involved. Um, so, uh, you know, that should involve regulations around tire size and brakes, among, among other things. Um, but also importantly, the, the scooters need to be maintained by legitimate employees uh, with a local team of mechanics, um, similar to how the city's Indigo Bike Share operates. Um, it should not be done through the gig economy. Um, where we see a lot of flawed uh, maintenance. Scooters will uh, use public resources to operate, so they should serve all Philadelphians in a way that prioritizes equity. Other cities require a certain percentage of scooters to be placed in low-income and predominantly minority neighborhoods, and Philadelphia should not only do this, but they should lead the way with the most progressive regulations uh, for equitable rebalancing. Rebalancing should match the demographics of our city and should serve the communities with less access to transit and those uh, with the most to gain from increased mobility. Scooters should be available to those without smartphones, they should offer cash fares, and should be discounted for anyone on a local, state, or federal assistance program. Data is another important issue to consider with scooters. Um, privacy is an issue that the council recognizes with sharing data, um, but we believe that uh, the trips can properly be anonymized by randomizing the start and end point. Um, that's not that heavy of a lift, we don't believe. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that 
uh, information can be made public uh, and uh, people can use it to, to do great things. So Indigo Bike Share makes all their data public. The city has a, an open data uh, commitment. Um, and the partner companies that operate scooters here should share in this commitment. Um, companies should also have a public API um, that can be integrated into trip planning software. Finally, the city needs to be confident in its ability to enforce whatever regulations or agreements it comes up with for scooters and what mechanism that enforcement will happen through. Um, as we see through parked cars on crosswalks and in sidewalks, uh, idling vehicles and a number of other traffic issues, uh, the city's not great at enforcing these types of things. So we need to make sure there's a good plan for that in place. Um, while the council has several concerns about implementing scooters in a way that prioritizes sustainability, safety, equity, and transparency, we believe the city and the companies that want to operate here can address all these concerns. The council is excited about any new mode that curbs greenhouse gas emissions, and we have uh, little more than a decade left to, uh, to make ra major reductions in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Uh, we simply cannot afford to miss out on opportunities to electrify a large portion of our transportation fleet. Thank you very much. Please state your name and pre present your testimony. Good morning. My name is Liz Cornish. I'm the executive director of Bike More. We are Baltimore City's Livable Streets Advocacy Organization, and I'm pleased to have been invited to testify before the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities today. Um, scooters arrived in Baltimore in the late summer of 2018. They were met with excitement, skepticism, and some confusion. The city's Department of Transportation launched a pilot program, inviting two vendors, Bird and Lime, to operate in the city so that all stakeholders could examine the viability of a program focused on micro-mobility solutions. The pilot program has been an overwhelming success. Over the past six months of the pilot program, dockless scooters and bikes have seen 755,952 rides, by over 190,000 riders. So even assuming that each of those riders has registered and ridden on both companies' scooters, that's 100,000 people who have taken a ride on a dockless scooter. For context, Baltimore has a population of 610,000 people, so that means at least 16% of the city has ridden a scooter in six months. In a survey taken by over 5,000 people, 81% are in favor of continuing the program. When asked how they would improve dockless service, the top three requests in order of importance were safe places to ride, more scooters, and dedicated dockless parking. What's important to note here is that all three of these improvements are things that the city controls. Some of our key takeaways as advocates during the pilot is that the city should dedicate the revenue generated from dockless programs towards improving infrastructure. In Baltimore, that's a discussion that has been happening among advocates and city officials, but has not been codified. This is pervasive in many of our transportation programs, revenue from transportation going back into the general fund. If we hope to continue to change behavior and allow these mobility solutions to thrive, we have to build the type of infrastructure that encourages ridership and keeps people safe. I would also recommend city officials work closely with dockless companies to make data sharing as transparent and open as possible without compromising proprietary information. This would allow the public to analyze data in a way that may exceed the city's ability given time, talent, and resources and provide important insight into ridership and placement one of the only ways a city can monitor if the scooters are being distributed equitably. In Baltimore, we initially used community statistical areas to attempt to distribute scooters in more neighborhoods with need, but found that this geographic metric was imperfect. Finding the right geographic distribution is important to ensure more people have access to the scooters. Whenever new technology or improvements emerge, questions usually arise about who these new amenities are for. Baltimore is a majority black city. It is also an intensely segregated city, one with a history of concentrating investments in the more affluent, predominantly white areas of the city. By their nature, dockless scooters and bikes have the ability to be distributed more widely throughout the city. Scooters have also proven appealing to a broader range of users than those who bike. Scooters don't come with the baggage that bikes sometimes do. What do you wear? What happens to my hair? Will I look childish, arrive sweaty, or stigmatized as too poor to own a car? Scooters have been made cool by a younger range of riders. They are, in short, more socially acceptable than riding a bike. 
Inviting more people to get out of their cars and experience public space differently has huge impacts long term on how we design cities and who they are designed for. Another interesting benefit of dockless mobility is the ability to turn scooter charging into an extra source of income for residents who are underemployed. While not a single source solution to the lack of access to employment, I think it encourages cities to think differently about all the ways programs like this can have an economic benefit to residents. Sidewalk riding has been a concern. There are scooters sometimes left strewn on the sidewalk, hampering ADA access, and pedestrians often feel their space is being encroached upon by people moving at speeds that can cause injury to them. But to my knowledge, there has not been any serious crashes involving scooters and pedestrians. The legislation Baltimore is currently developing attempts to address this, allowing sidewalk riding on streets where speeds exceed 30 miles per hour, but limiting scooter speed to six miles per hour. But I personally view that as this is a complicated solution to a pretty simple problem, and one the city has full control of. Just build more safe places for people to ride. Create streets that serve the needs of all users and tip the scales of safety towards those most vulnerable and at risk of injury or death. Cities struggle to meet the mobility needs of their residents. Roads are hard to maintain, cars are expensive to park, and mass transit takes a long time to build. Scooters and bikes are not a silver bullet, but if a private company is willing to pick up the tab to meet a civic need in a way that is equitable and environmentally sustainable, I believe it is in a city's best interest to do what they can to ensure their success, build safe places to ride, create a permitting process that generates a return on investment for both parties, and get ahead of community concerns by creating designated places to park dockless bikes and scooters. Thanks for your time. Please state your name, begin your testimony. Certainly. Thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Professor Megan Smurdy Ryerson. I'm the UPS Chair of Transportation at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a professor of transportation engineering and urban planning. Uh, I'm not an advocate. I'm a professor and a researcher of safe transportation infrastructure. I'm a resident who uh, loves this city, uh, and I'm a parent, uh, a Phil Ed parent, uh, raising my children in Mark Squilla's district. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, what will the introduction of a new mode of transportation into our already diverse transportation system look like? I'm a professor, so I have to bring out classic transportation theories uh, that will tell us the answer. Mode shifting, safety in numbers, and induced demand. Scooters offer a new mobility option. One, and we've heard about these previous studies, which have, which have significantly reduced demand for ride share and driving in our peer cities. New scooter riders increase drivers' awareness of everything moving on the road that isn't a car. The safety in numbers phenomenon encourages more people to get out and bike, scoot, or walk. Demand for separated, protected, multi-purpose bike scooter lane infrastructure will become impossible to ignore. Once built, it will induce new demand. With better infrastructure, more and more people will be comfortable using bikes and scooters and walking. We have seen induced demand at work in Philadelphia already. Councilman um, Johnson, you, you mentioned this. Uh, our new bike lanes have propelled us to our first place standing among big cities for our share of bicycle commuters, and our pedestrian and bike-friendly paths and river trails are packed with people of all ages year-round. It is clear that when we give Philadelphians access to safe and enjoyable transportation alternatives to driving, they will use them. But what about scooter safety? Let's take a minute to consider the safety of Philadelphia's current transportation system, the, sister, the system that scooters would be joining. Today, among peer cities, Philadelphia has the dubious distinction of having the highest rate of traffic deaths per capita. Nearly half are pedestrians and cyclists. Ten percent are heartbreakingly children. Counting crashes and fatalities, however, obscures an even more treacherous reality. These numbers reflect reported crashes and deaths and do not account for the near misses and dangerous interactions that happen multiple times a day. Nor do they account for losses to the economy and quality of life when people limit their mobility for fear of being struck. Let me pause to make this point. The number of traffic deaths, as staggeringly high as it is, nowhere near covers the unmeasured safety hazards that force people to limit their mobility. This is the complete focus of my own research program. 
What is an unmeasured safety hazard? Let's just consider crossing at an intersection with a stop sign. Likely with a rideshare vehicle stopped in the crosswalk or cars parked legally or illegally up to the stop line. You step into the street to pa pass the car, the parked car, scan and make eye contact with the driver and hope that they will stop given the acceptability of the Philly slide or the rolling stop signs. The, the elderly and the mobility impaired cannot manage this nuanced crossing and certainly children who otherwise would be of age to walk to school by themselves also cannot manage this nuanced crossing. So they don't walk outside alone. The only way we will achieve Vision Zero, zero traffic deaths, to mi and mitigate these very hard to measure safety hazards is through infrastructure design. Infrastructure design that slows down traffic, design that makes pedestrians and cyclists more visible, and design that physically separates vehicles, bikes and scooters, and pedestrians. Otis, Otis's Connect Plan understands the importance of infrastructure redevelopment, and it's focused on holistic design improvements for all modes. The residents of Philadelphia understand this. 28 neighborhoods filed slow zone applications last month showing us that there is broad support for slowing down traffic and creating safe infrastructure. We also know how to do this. Otis's own Chestnut Street Transportation Project, which repurposed a lane of Chestnut Street for a parking protected bike lane, counterintuitively did not impede traffic flow, but rather improved efficiency for all users through the integration of dedicated turn lanes and loading zones. It also drastically improved safety for pedestrians, as parked cars and bollards create refuge areas, putting pedestrians directly in driver's line of sight and reducing pedestrian crossing distance. This shorter and safer crossing has brought those with limited mobility limitations back out to walk around, participate in the economy, and do the things that we love to do in Philly. Yet proposals for safe transportation infrastructure projects still struggle to generate the political buy-in needed for implementation. This is why, to me, scooters can be an ally in safe mobility. They bring awareness and visibility to non-motorized options. They incite demand for safer, separated facilities, accelerating development beyond what we could and what we are achieving with biking alone. They, they are an ally in transportation equity, taking Indigo's model to the next level by accommodating those physically unable or uncomfortable biking and mitigating the issues of station placement. To leverage this alliance upon launching a pilot with scooters, we must do two things. First, we must put protections in place to ensure that scooters themselves are safe and well maintained while also recognizing the inequity in banning scooters on the grounds of safety when other forms of automated mobility are not, uh, are not held to the same standard. We have to hold those two things in our hands at the same time. Second, we must prepare accordingly to recognize scooters as a part of our transportation system. We can lead by design, proactively building safe, separated infrastructure. A place for everything, everything in its place, said uh, UPenn's beloved founder, uh, Ben Franklin. Fundamentally, complete streets with, with spaces for vehicles, bikes and scooters, and pedestrians that are protected make movement safer, more efficient, more reliable, and more enjoyable for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilman Derek Green? Yes, I'll, I'll be brief because we have Please. another matter. <laughs> coming up, um, but I, from the panel, just listening to the testimony, and I heard information based on other cities like Cincinnati and Portland and Baltimore, um, from what I hear, it sounds like e-scooters is a progressive transportation form. Would that be correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. Also, what I'm also hearing, what I gather, is that e-scooters are not this significant safety hazard that was testified to earlier. Is that also correct? That's correct. Okay. And then, and then um, just in closing, it seems that this is a, a type of transportation that we should be moving forward to in a very um, progressive way, considering a number of other cities have done so, uh, especially based on the fact from what I heard from the panel that it will reduce people's use of cars as a form of transportation if we have some type of e-scooter system. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason why Philly can't participate in a pilot program. Um, that's really up to the city um, and the Department of Transportation and City Council to develop those constraints. Um, but we found that that was a way to bring all of the stakeholders together, whether it was the vendors, advocates, and um, city officials. And we set the parameters, we measured the success, and we got people that have never gotten out of their cars um, to take short trips downtown, suddenly parking their cars and doing their sort of day-to-day -day errands via scooter and having a lot of fun doing it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I want to acknowledge the presence of Councilwoman Helen Gim. Councilman Mark Squillo. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and obviously, um, looking as the city com does goes through their complete streets program and the Vision Zero program, uh, safety is a, is a concern. And I think adding additional revenue to the streets department to do the streets is very important. And uh, we're going to be going through our budget process very shortly, and hopefully we'll see a that increase or advocating for that increase. Um, but <clears throat> as we see the use of scooters, and I'm, I'm pretty supportive, I'm supportive of a pilot in my district, um, if we could get it working, if working with the, the providers and with the city and uh, Otis and to see how we could regulate it in a way, because here's the issue, if we do a pilot and it doesn't work well, the odds of growing that into a citywide program become less. Uh, so we want to be able to not say, all right, we just want to learn from it and make it a negative impact. We want it to make it, if we do it, a, an ability that, to learn from it, but also that it would not be a negative impact and look at a positive impact in the community that has it. The hard part about a pilot is, where do these scooters go? And I know there's geotechnology to be able to uh, fence certain areas. Um, but the, the challenge is then getting them back and then seeing how it affects, impacts other communities. Um, so there is some work still to do to do that. Um, I would support it uh, in my uh, district. And, uh, you know, it's a learning curve, right? Other, other municipalities have done this. You, you guys in, in Baltimore said that you have some issues and concerns. Uh, to have the scooters riding up and down sidewalks on our small sidewalks would be not very good here in Philadelphia. Uh, maybe it works in Baltimore. Um, I mean, I think the issue is that if people, people will always gravitate to where they feel the most safe. Um, and I think that the actual reality um, has not met the expectations of the concerns that people had initially. And I think there's really um, affordable solutions to those concerns. And that's like put a dedicated parking area for the scooters to go. That's something that even users wanted to see. Um, and then, of course, using that revenue to then leverage state and federal funds to then be able to do larger scale infrastructure projects. In Baltimore, our protected bike lanes are used by lots of different people. Um, we have, in my neighborhood, I live on one of the protected bike lanes. We have a public housing, you know, a public housing that houses seniors, specifically with mobility issues. And I see a lot of people using their mobility devices to use this protected lane because it's much nicer than the sidewalks. Um, and it's, they can't roll on the sidewalks the way they are in disrepair. So I think that's um, something to consider is that it is challenging to balance all of the modes and the usage, but when you design safe places for people to use it, lots of people will, regardless of it's scooter, bike, or whatever. And anytime you have something new and there's a change, it's, uh, it's hard for some folks to get, wrap their hand, hands around, but you know, we have to try it and use it, and you rather try it and make mistakes and then learn from them and, and move forward than not do them at all. So um, I think you're going to see a, a, a ramp up of this to see, you know, how it will work. Obviously, um, it's probably the bike share program will be, um, bike dockless bike will be done first, um, and then maybe a pilot after that, after we get our policy out for the, this is just my opinion. It has to be decided by council. But um, uh, we'll, we'll continue to grow our model of how we move people around the city the safest and uh, most efficient way as possible. So thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Councilman Sherelle Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, Sarah, I wanted to uh, thank you for including uh, in your testimony something that I uh, haven't heard thus far, and that is how do you handle broken 
scooters and how long will they be there. So I'm often uh, sharing with my two colleagues, Councilman Squilla and Councilman um, Johnson, that my district is further north. I am, uh, you know, much further away from Center City uh, than many others. So I'm in an area that is highly dense, highly residential, and uh, for me, what um, could present an opportunity to gain access um, to equitable uh, transportation modes can also end up as blight. And so um, with that being said, if you could just share with us in Baltimore, particularly in neighborhoods that are highly dense, what are some of the strategies and techniques that you've employed to ensure uh, just that? Um, I was happy to hear you talk about equitable access, right? So extremely important, but what do you do in a neighborhood sure. that is highly dense and highly residential? Yeah, I mean, I th there's gonna be vandalism. Um, you're gonna see that happen. So I don't wanna say that it doesn't happen in Baltimore. I think what we can compare it to is that the city launched um, a city operated bike share program that was unsuccessful and a big reason of that was vandalism and theft because um, they just didn't design the technology appropriately. Um, the scooter companies, however, have the resources to do those designs appropriately and we haven't seen um, nearly as big of an issue in terms of of the blight and the vandalism that you've talked about. I also, um, what's really great though, is because they are a private vendor and they are held to very strict operating standards, the city can then discipline them um, if they are not meeting the standards of getting those things off of the street as quickly as possible. And so, and I think because, you know, I think that's where sharing the APA API data becomes really critical because then you can, the city can monitor that from you know from a perspective, uh, and then what we put to the vendors as advocates, we say if you don't understand Baltimore, we aren't going to support you operating here, um, and the big part of that is making sure that the PR piece about if people just start to see these broken scooters everywhere, the same way they feel about broken anything. Um, they don't feel cared for, they don't feel valued, and we want anybody that we invite to do business in the city to care and value our residents. Um, so long term, I, I haven't seen it be nearly as big of a problem as other things in the past. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with access. So more people have access to this, so it feels like it's for them. And because dockless, by their nature, can end up in more neighborhoods easily, um, it's not seen as something that people have to sort of push back against because they feel like it's not happening for them. It's happening for them. Um, so they have some sense of ownership. And because we talked about the diverse and huge ridership, um, you don't get 100,000 people riding it without people in some of our most neighborhoods of with need also riding these scooters. So I think that's an interesting facet of this that I'm as let an me, advocate. Let me yeah. interject here oh, yeah, and sure. ask I mean, you, have you, have you found a way to uh, work with the city relative to public, it's public property, it's public assets. So now I'm talking about recreation centers, I'm mm -hmm. talking about areas yeah. that are owned, you know, by uh, various sure. municipalities. Is there any sort of public-private partnerships that have been developed making maybe a section or portion mm -hmm. of those centers as one of the locations uh, for parking or access? So, yeah, that's a really good point. So um, just to clarify, the, the scooters themselves are privately owned. So unlike a um, par public-private partnership that you'll get into about bike share where the city might procure the docks and the bikes and they own that but a vendor operates it, the scooters are still owned by the company. Um, but in terms of where you're talking about, like, how do you create hubs for these things to appear and to make sure that they're getting rebalanced? The, look, the issue for me yeah. is where will so, you yeah. gain access so to what, and then, so, so I, what I'm Baltimore, asking you, yeah. one second, oh, sorry. one second, please. Thank you so very much. Um, so what I'm asking is, in an effort to provide access in the most efficient mm -hmm. way possible, the private firms mm -hmm. who own the scooter mm -hmm. companies, have they anywhere across the nation that you are familiar with, mm -hmm. or in Baltimore, have they utilized public property to, uh, in essence, install mm -hmm. their, their private infrastructure? And, and hence, mm -hmm. that is what I'm describing mm -hmm. when I discuss the potential for mm -hmm. a public-private. Yeah. Okay. 
um, investment. Yes, they do place the scooters on public property okay. um, in the right of way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, talking about sidewalk, certain parts of the sidewalk or certain parts of a, a city park, um, they do geofence so that they can't. You can't drop them off in certain areas, so the city gets to decide mm -hmm. where they can be parked and located. I talked a little bit about um, the equity piece and how the city can monitor mm -hmm. that. We used community statistical areas trying to figure and say you have to put this many in this area every day, um, but they were too big. And so what we, what, where the city is going now is like we know where people need first and last mile solutions. We know where there's a high concentration of people that would benefit from using this. So we're looking at creating mobility hubs. So putting those areas where the scooter companies are required to drop them off every morning and rebalance them. Um, and in those mobility hubs, there would be maybe more support and instructions to invite more people to use it so it's a little bit clearer. And then that becomes a much more predictable way for people to find them. And then in terms of what we have seen um, that I think is really interesting is that because of the gig economy of like getting the scooters and being a charger, um, the scooter companies can incentivize them being dropped off or, or picked up um, based on that. So it's an app and they can change the prices. So scooters that are really far away, um, they can, upcharge them for people to bring them back and get charged and then in the morning um, they can have the potential to incentivize putting them out in specific places and so I think that's something that's really interesting because um, they just have because of that technology and that sort of large workforce they can tap um, it's easier for them to do that I think than the city's been able to so do. Sarah I w again want to uh, say thank you for the bicycle coalition for injecting uh, this sort of issue within uh, your testimony you. and we would definitely continue um, uh, to count on uh, hearing your voices as we we figure out what this looks like in our city so th thank you for including it in your testimony thank you councilwoman that's an important point is that in terms of the the broken scooters it's on the company to to take care of it they have to resolve it a lot of that risk in a sort of small r risk is on the companies not the city I, I, I just want to make a, I just want to make a comment. Um, just encouraging this scooter Brief, blight. Please. Scooter blight is absolutely a, a concern. I just want to encourage everyone as they're thinking through, thinking through regulating scooters, thinking through, you know, what will scooter blight look like. I'm equally, if not more, concerned with the blight of parked cars abandoned and uh, rideshare vehicles everywhere in our unprotected bike lanes constantly stopped and st stopped in um, stopped in crosswalks cars parked illegally uh, completely covering the intersection so we cannot park safely there's a an epidemic of transportation blight across modes uh, and I, I'm concerned that we're talking about scooters so very much and not rideshare just because it's easier to regulate scooters than it is to regulate rideshare. And so, I, I, again, I think it's hard to, we need to hold both of these things in our hand. We absolutely should be talking about scooter safety and scooter blight, but I think that we really need to address holistic transportation safety. Let me thank you sure. so very much for, uh, for your comment just now. Um, and sort of when you talk about the different types of blight that are in neighborhoods, so um, not sure, uh, particularly for those who are in the center city area, if you are familiar with the portion of Philadelphia that is bounded by Sheltonham Avenue. Mm -hmm. We have two wonderful malls. One is Sheltonham and one is Cedarbrook Mall. Mm -hmm. So aside from bikes, believe it or not, shopping carts present blight in our neighborhood. So aside from parked cars and abandoned cars, we even have shopping carts. So when we sort of talk about blight, um, and although it is on the company to remove them, we have to be hypersensitive about the impact that it will have on the aesthetic appeal in communities, um, although they still have some sense of blight in those, in those neighborhoods. So I, I appreciate your adding value to the discussion. Thank you. Councilman Mark Squilla. Thank you. And, and last comment. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and I, we agree with that. And the whole thing is putting regulations, policies, and laws in place, which we have, and especially for uh, motor vehicles. Uh, the issue comes in with enforcement. 
Uh, we have a lot, a lot of laws already in place. We need to work on our enforcement. And um, even when we do these policies for uh, dockless bikes or, or, or scooters or bike share, you know, we put the rules and laws in place. We have to then work on what are the resources necessary to enforce them. And that's something we don't do very well in Philadelphia and we need to do better. Uh, so if, both for all modes of transportation and uh, it's going to be something moving forward if we're really serious about Vision Zero, enforcement is a big part of that. So thank you. Thank you. And just before I bring up this last panel, I remember in my conversation with Sherry Shapiro regarding Lyme and I asked the same question regarding um, the maintenance of these um, dockless scooters and, and the Sherry. I kind of really don't want to bring you back up because I want to move the process forward, but I do remember her talking about how um, the maintenance and the checkup on the scooters are every evening. So they can actually map out, right, all of their scooters and also with the maintenance of their scooters each day kind of keep a handle on where the scooters are, if scooters are broken down, how they're being maintained and the maintenance of it as it relates to the scooters just being everywhere. Did I say that correctly, Sherry? You want to come up real real quick and kind of clarify what I said? Because I asked that question. Um, thank you, Councilwoman. You brought up something that I love to talk about. So briefly, I will though, do it but briefly. very briefly. It goes like this. Lime will bring an operations team to Philadelphia. It will bring between 10 and 30 jobs here. It is the responsibility of that local team to make sure that not only are our scooters being well cared for, but that they're in the places where people will use them. It doesn't, unfortunately, make us any money to have a scooter that is sitting in a parking lot for two days. So it's very uh, valuable to us to make sure that those scooters are moved. But more importantly, we have a great way of um, consolidating issues. We connect with the city's 311 system. So people in the city who see something, they can use the same system to report any problems that go directly to us. Um, and that makes it much easier for people. They don't have to find out who Lyme is or what, um, but they can report that. Yeah. And I'd be happy to give you more information, but that gives you a, a little framework of what we do. You might want to partner with your competitors to kind of figure out how we make their process streamlined across the board. That's just for the record. So I want to call up <laughs> um, the next panel. Thank and, and I want to thank, thank all of you, you for your testimony. This is our last panel, and so um, if there's anyone else going to testify on this particular uh, resolution, besides the two names that are going to be called, I'm going to ask you to please come. Um, to the uh, microphone and then um, we'll wrap up this last panel. Oren we'll Eisenberg and Will Burns. I just, I just want to say for the record also in having this conversation um, I think we're going to see these doctor scooters one way or another in the future. And here's how I know. So I'm a new dad, I have two toddlers. And I drop my children off to school every morning. And probably half the parents that I see taking their children to school are just on the little children's scooters. But they're also setting up the mind frame of using scooters as a mode of transportation just about every day while I'm dropping my little ones off. And so rather it's now or later, um, I, I actually see with my own eyes, this being the mode of transportation just for those in the toddler world. Um, but I just want to state that for the record in terms of kind of the correlation between the two. Um, as they get older and may just want to have more of a, an actual electrical scooter as opposed to having a typical bicycle. So at least that's my personal experience. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thanks, my name is Oren Eisenberg. Uh, I'm a citizen in Philadelphia, and I'm also interested in maintaining uh, safe access to our streets. Council members and my fellow Philadelphians, 
I believe in a future Philadelphia that prioritizes efficient multimodal transportation, walkability, safety, and infrastructure to ultimately lessen our taxing reliance on cars. As we've heard today, electric scooters can be a valuable ingredient in that future. Unfortunately, I do not believe that future is here quite yet. I've spent a lot of time in Santa Monica over the past two years, which is one of the first cities overtaken by the scooter explosion. Having witnessed the city's transformation firsthand, I've come away with two conclusions uh, that I feel are critical in Philadelphia's consideration of this issue. First, and this is where I'll spend the bulk of my remaining time, Philadelphia streets are simply not adequate for scooters today. I regularly travel all across Philadelphia, mostly by bicycle, so I experience our roads up close and personal. And I've got to say, they are truly a disgrace. For one thing, city streets are laden with dangerous potholes that grow for months on end, and trenches dug by contractors that are improperly maintained. Uneven road surfaces are major safety hazards, period, but pose an even greater risk to scooter users due to their small size. Even mild bumps from patching can be treacherous when riding a scooter, and I've experienced that personally. If you don't fall into a hole, Philadelphia also invites you to enjoy the severely deteriorated striping of our travel lanes, especially evident in bike lanes where scooters are encouraged to ride. On many blocks, you cannot even see that there are multiple lanes delineated, leading to dangerous encounters with motor vehicles that are all too frequent. Philadelphia simply does not invest enough to adequately maintain its streets, and we haven't for years. We barely spend more than we did during the Great Recession a decade ago. Moreover, available data shows that we are routinely outspent when it comes to street maintenance by cities a fraction of our size, like Baltimore. But broken infrastructure is just a part of the story. Our streets also suffer from a culture problem, born from lax enforcement over years' time and unchecked aggression uh, supported by drivers uh, that has become an unfortunate norm a culture where motorists are emboldened to drive in reckless, impatient, and distracted manners without consequence, treat bike infrastructure as personal loading zones and on-demand parking, petition against the expansion of protected networks for alternate transportation, intimidate and exert power over other road users who they feel are in their way. Because Philly is lagging in the upkeep, expansion, and modernization of its bike lane network, the safety for scooter riders is a legitimate issue that should not be understated. Secondly, and I'll keep this very brief, you have to plan for users to do the wrong thing. Philly is a narrow, dense city. We don't have the luxury of wide sidewalks for scooter parking, even when this is done neatly. And getting people to, uh, to take the extra few seconds to do the right thing with a scooter will be a battle unto itself. The city must take proactive steps to create designated parking spaces in densely traveled areas to ensure pedestrian right-of-way is maintained and the mess from human error is contained. In closing, despite my concerns, I'm optimistic that scooters can one day be a viable transportation choice. Unfortunately, we will not have a city where scooters can thrive until we address the underlying structural issues that hold us back. Thank you for considering these issues in totality of their impact and for using the hearings today to set Philadelphia on a long-term path uh, towards offering more choice for multimodal transportation. Thank you very much. Please state your name for the record. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Will Burns. I'm the Director of Government Partnerships for SPIN. Um, so SPIN is a dockless electric scooter company like Bird and Lime. Um, and so before I go any further, I want to say, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for all the time and energy and hard work you're putting into this issue. Uh, this has been a very long hearing, and I appreciate yes. the fact that you long. are really taking this issue seriously, and I'm glad to be able to talk with you about it today. Um, just real quickly about SPIN, um, we were founded in 2016. Uh, and were acquired by Ford Motor Company in 2018 as part of their smart mobility initiative to figure out ways to move people around in cities and in the United States in different ways. So we operate in a number of the same markets that Bird and Lime does. Uh, one of the things that's different about SPIN compared to some of the other companies in this space is that one, we do not launch scooters in any jurisdiction where we do not have the authority to do so. 
So you'll never have to worry about a rogue launch from spin. Secondly, many of the people who work in our company come out of local government. I was a member of the Chicago City Council. Um, one of my colleagues worked in the Department of Transportation. Another person worked in Oakland City Council. So we understand the privilege of operating on the right of way and the necessity of finding solutions that create scooter win-wins for both cities and for the companies. To that end, we believe that the city of Philadelphia should enact a pilot program for scooters. One of the ways you control the externalities around scooters, including blight, is by having a reasonable cap on the number of scooters that can be deployed by each company during the initial pilot. That allows the city to get used to having scooters on the public way. It gives community members the opportunity to get adjusted to seeing scooters on the public way. And it also gives companies the opportunity to fine tune responses uh, to inevitable problems that will come up. Um, Last thing I will mention before I go, and, and I'm happy to take any questions, is that uh, one of the things we do to ensure that people park better is that we require you to take a picture of the scooter after you park it. And it's sent to our company, and the next person who picks up the scooter, we ask them, how did this person park the scooter? And then you reviewed. If you have a record of parking scooters poorly on a spin scooter, we can fine you. If we get cited because you did something poorly, we will tell you, hey, this time we're going to let you slide. But next time we're charging you 25 bucks because you parked the scooter inappropriately. Because we believe every time someone does something wrong like that, it reflects badly on us and it reflects badly on the opportunity to get people out of cars uh, and to use better ways to get around cities, especially for short trips. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions from members of the community? Okay. Thank you very much Thank for your you. testimony. This concludes the public hearing on Resolution 181113. This hearing will stand in recess to the call of the chair. Thank you very much, everyone, for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. This hearing is called to order. This is a public hearing of the City Council Committee on Transportation. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on Bill 181063. I am Councilman Kenyatta Johnson. I'm chair of this Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities. I just noticed that. And we will be starting shortly. You're not going to ride it, are you? You're not going to ride it, are you? <laughs> You're not going to ride it out here? Yeah. <laughs> Ah. Uh -huh. 